Erev Tov, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you're watching Israeli News Live. This evening, we have a very special guest with us here at our apartment here in Jerusalem, uh, where we're staying at, and uh, it is Avi Lipkin. Many people that uh, read Avi's books know him by his Jewish name, Victor Mordecai. Uh, he is an author of seven books. One of the books that I actually have myself is, Is Fanatic Islam a Global Threat? And, uh, of course, you can look up Avi on his website, www.vicmord.com. Vic Mord, like the abbreviations of his uh, Hebrew name that he uses, uh, that he writes under. And we're going to be talking to Avi a little bit today about the political situations as well as the Islamic threats that is facing, facing both uh, Israel, as well as Europe, the European Union, that is, and also the United States with the uh, problems that have happened since the ISIS has, uh, excuse me, uh, since Syria uh, has become a major disaster in the Middle East and causing a major influx of Muslims all over the world. So without any further ado, let me introduce to you our very special guest, Avi Lipkin. Well, uh, you know, I, uh, I think God has a tremendous uh, sense of humor. Uh, I moved to Israel at age 19. I left my mom and dad in New York at age 19. And uh, actually, I really hated Christians. Uh, I hated Christians because of the Nazi Holocaust. So I hated the Germans, all Germans, even Texas Germans, uh, until I started going to churches in Texas. Uh, I hated the, the Russians, the Polish, I had the Slavic nations for what they did to us in the pogroms and persecutions. Uh, I hated the uh, Catholics, you know, for the Inquisition, Spain, Portugal, France, Italy. Uh, and actually, uh, it had been inculcated in me in Hebrew school in New York that one day the Protestants were going to kill us too. Because in every country, the Christians eventually, inevitably, have to turn on the Jews. And when I was 15, this is in 1964, I had a Hebrew teacher who encouraged me to write letters to David Ben-Gurion, who was the first prime minister of Israel. And at age 15, uh, I, I wrote to him. He answered me two letters out of the five that I wrote to him. I was batting 400. That's pretty good. And uh, I decided at age 15 from his letters that I had to move to Israel. He said, all Jews must move to Israel. So I said, I'm going to move to Israel. He said, if you don't move to Israel, you know, your children are going to intermarry, your grandkids are going to intermarry. And uh, there will, you know, in two, three generations, your family will not be Jewish anymore. Uh, and he was right. So I moved to Israel at age 19. So I was very, very anti-Christian. I kind of liked the Muslims because in Spain in 1492, we were allies with the Muslims uh, against the Catholics. And Catholics booted us out with the Muslims from Spain. And um, so I got to Israel, and I felt like uh, Lawrence of Arabia. I was very influenced by the movie Lawrence of Arabia, and I saw myself with the blue eyes, you know, with a keffiyeh, riding on a camel in the desert with the Arab Bedouin. And uh, my mom said to me, rest in peace, my mom said to me, you're not Lawrence of Arabia, you're Avi of the Negev. <laughs> so Avi of the Negev. Anyway, so I was so happy to be this Aryan pure Jew living in the Jewish state, getting away from the Christians. And then God has a sense of humor. He gives me my wife, Rachel. And Rachel says to me, you know, are you crazy? Our first meeting, you know, I'm going to interview her for, my, uh, Hebrew, uh, for the Hebrew University newspaper. Uh, she, it, so she starts interviewing me. She says, are you crazy? Why did you leave America? America is a land of peace. America is a land of wealth. I said, the Goyim hate us. You know, the Gentiles hate us. I said, she said to me, Gentiles? Who are the Gentiles? I said, the Christians. She said, oh, you don't know anything, she said to me. Christians are not Gentiles. The Muslims are the Gentiles. Christians have the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It said so seven times in the New Testament. Christians also believe in the same Old Testament as the Jews. And thirdly, Messiah is a Jew from Israel who speaks Hebrew. Jews and Christians agree on that. Uh, the Muslims have another god. They have a god called Allah, Al-Ilahi, which means Allah, the moon god. You see that the moon crescent. That's right. Which, by the way, is a capital offense in Deuteronomy 17 for any Jew or Christian. Believing in Islam is a capital offense. If you prostrate, which they do, prostrate to the moon, the sun, and the stars, 
take him to the gates of the city and stone him. That's in the Bible of the Jews and the Christians. Deuteronomy 17. Secondly, they have another book called the Quran. And the Quran is a destroyer book. It destroys the book of the Jews and the Christians, the Bible. And thirdly, their Messiah is coming back a second time to slaughter the Jews on Saturday and the Christians on Sunday. And it, the funny thing is, you know, they laugh. And the Jews are the Saturday people, kill them on Saturday. The Christians are the Sunday people, kill them on Sunday. Um, so the Jews and the Christians are one people. We're the people of the book. And, uh, you know, like I heard my wife saying this when I was 20 years old. I couldn't believe it. So I, I heard what she said, but it wasn't until I was 40 years old, 20 years later, that I began to go to churches to speak as an Israeli army officer. And uh, I came to the conclusion my wife was right, that the Jews and the Christians are one people. And I'm forming a Judeo-Christian party to run for government in Israel because the Jews and Christians are going to be coming home to Israel soon. Absolutely. And one thing you know, I might add on that, uh, those, of the, those of you that want to support uh, the movement that Avi is doing on this particular party here. I assume they can even donate to this cause on your website? Okay, now well, that's a very good question. At this stage, the best thing to do is to mail a, a check in any currency. Mail a check to me uh, at my post office box here in Israel. Okay. Uh, but not, make the check out to Advocate Caleb Myers. A, the lawyer who's registering our party, and we already have 100 signatures. We're short twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000, but that's very close now. So yes. by the end of October, God willing, the party will be registered. I will go for a very intense fundraising meeting to the U.S. in November, December. And then when I come back in mid-December, uh, uh, mid uh, we start our campaign. We begin to campaign for the next elections, even though no elections have been called. We start with parlor meetings, going to churches, meeting with pastors, you know, meeting with different groups. And uh, I hate to say Jimmy Carter did it, but Jimmy Carter did it through parlor meetings. He, he became president of the U.S. because of parlor meetings. Uh, Avi, you were mentioning just a minute ago about the Goim and how that your wife was a, a big part of that for you to show who the Goim really are, the, Muslim, the Muslims, Muslims, however we want to call them there. And that kind of brings me to another major issue that we're looking at. And I know just from where we've talked privately a little bit as well, too, uh, I've been an advocate of, of President Putin mainly because I don't believe in, I believe in telling what's true. And I watched, I really got into this issue uh, standing with him when I saw what happened in Ukraine. Uh, it was very obvious, uh, knowing uh, from the former CIA director, uh, John Stockwell, that said the United States government participates in overthrow overthrowing democracies. And then, as with my family living in Eastern Europe, and we, my wife and my father-in-law speak five languages, we know a lot of what's going on over there. And I seen that Putin was kind of being picked on uh, by NATO. And um, that's another issue altogether, but... It's been stated, even by the defense minister of the Czech Republic just a few days ago, that the United States was the cause of the Muslim problem. Not so much the United States, but the uh, Obama administration has been the cause of the problem, uh, the Muslim problem going into Europe and now even into the United States because the Barack administration had armed the, the ISIS and the different rebel factions that are here in the Middle East here. And, uh, and Putin is only trying to bring it into that. And, and I actually, uh, and I'm going to let you go with this in just a second. I've gotten an email from a friend of mine here in Israel that's very close to Netanyahu about almost a year ago. And because at that time I had some concerns about what Russia's uh, actions would be, because many people say that Russia's part of the Gog and Magog uh, equation. And I was a little concerned, but he assured me, he said, Steve, he says, we already have made an agreement with Putin with the Russians and everything, and Putin swore that he would come in and take out ISIS for Israel and that he would have Israel's back. Okay, well, firstly, uh, I studied uh, Russian and Sovietology uh, for my BA at uh, New York University for two years, and then I did three more years. I had to redo my BA at Hebrew University. It took me five years to get a BA in Sovietology, Russian studies, and um, I think I understand the situation. 
uh, I've written my seventh book, seven books, but the seventh book, chapter one, is about American policy in the Middle East and Russia and Ukraine. Chapter two is about Russian policy. And so I talk about these things in my most recent book. And the book is totally up to date, so I recommend people get it. It's called Islamic Rivalry. Islamic Rivalry, uh, Iran versus ISIS. And one of the things I share uh, is that I look at things uh, from a um, Cold War type approach, because that's how the Americans look at it. That's how the Europeans look at it. That's how the Russians look at it. Uh, I. Uh, appeared on, on Radio Moscow uh, in Russian in June of 1994. And uh, the interview was in Russian. And I said to the Russians, America is not your enemy anymore. Europe is not your enemy anymore. And Israel and the Jews are not your enemy anymore. The enemy of Russia has always been Islam. I said, you know, the, the, uh, Mother Russia has been fighting Islam for a thousand years. Uh, the Holy Orthodox Russian Church was established in 995 AD by Cyril and Methodius as a, a, a reaction to the Tatar and Circassian and Chechen invasions from the south. Uh, my, my family roots are from Ukraine and from Poland and Russia. And you, know, the, you have a thousand years of war between the Russians and the Turks, different types of Turks. Uh, there is a very strong animosity uh, against Russia and the Russian people by the Turks, who are Sunnis. The Turkish Sunnis and the Arab Sunnis are backed by the US, Europe, and the Vatican. Exactly. The Russians are backing the enemy of the Sunnis, which are the Shiites, which are the Iranians, the Sh Iraqi Shiites, Hezbollah in Lebanon, and Bashar al-Assad in the Alawites, and of course the Houthis in uh, Yemen. So my, my, my fears and my prayers are that there should not be a World War III, because you have a, a, a tinderbox ready to explode. Yes. And, it, 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 and I hate to say it, but uh, war is good for business. Uh, the United States, <laughs> Uh, really was still in its depression days until the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor. Um, war was good for the United States. America lost uh, millions of people. Uh, Russia lost 20 million people. Germans lost 20 million people. The Japanese lost. Everybody lost people. The Jews lost 6 million people. Uh, but war is good for the military industrial complex. And I'm very fearful that there are people on both sides who are pushing for war so that good young boys and girls on both sides will die, which, which would break my heart because I love the American people, I love the Russian people, and a war is totally uncalled for. And uh, regarding the question of uh, even the Ukraine and, uh, and Putin, uh, Khrushchev uh, in 1954, a year after the death of Stalin, gave Ukraine a tremendous amount of land to placate the Ukrainian people for the 30 million Ukrainians killed by Stalin in the 30s and 40s. Um, the, it was called Khrushchev's Folly. Yeah, you can look, look it up in Google. It's, it's history. Uh, Khrushchev, who was a Ukrainian, uh, doubled the size of Ukraine in 1954. When the Ukraine uh, broke away from uh, Russia, Russia said, OK, give us back our land. <laughs> the Russians are right because the people in the eastern part of the Ukraine are Russian. Uh, but of course, uh, all of this is being ignored in the Western press. Uh, do the Western Catholic, the Western Catholic Ukrainians, do they have the right to join NATO? Of course they do. Do they have the right to join the European Union? Of course they do. But if the Russian people, the 10 million Russians in eastern uh, Ukraine, want to remain with Mother Russia, then that's the right. That's what the, probably there should be a vote about it, a referendum. Um, but we cannot forget for a moment that the Turks and the Muslims are backing the Catholics in Western Ukraine. Uh, there is a horrible, horrible animosity against uh, the Turks. I have just one little thing I want to share. I was listening, you know, I, I always listen to the news programs on Israeli uh, Reshid Bet, which is probably going to be shut down pretty soon. Probably reborn again. I hope it will be as good as it was in the past or better. An Israeli army officer was being interviewed. 
he was from a minority group here in Israel known as the Circassians. Now, the Circassians are Turks. They're not Arabs. They're Turks. Now, there was a war from 1853 to 1856. It was called the Crimean War. This was a war of Britain, France, and Turkey against Tsarist Russia. And uh, Russia lost. You heard of the charge of the Light Brigade and Sevastopol and all this, yes. Sevastopol. And um, in 1854, uh, there was a massacre. There was a Holocaust. And this Circassian officer, an officer in the Israeli army, who is a Circassian Muslim, a Sunni, says that there's a hill in a city. There's a city called Sochi. You heard of Sochi. That's where the Olympics were. Yes. And there's a hill in the middle of the town called Red Hill. So you think Red Hill because of the Communist Party. No, it was red because of the blood of three million Circassians butchered by the Tsarist army. So there is a hatred uh, against the Russians. Uh, the surviving Circassians fled to Turkey, Ottoman Turkey, and the Ottoman Sultan uh, sent them to Israel to be in the garrisons of the Turkish army in Israel. So when Israel got its independence, they weren't really Turks. They were South Russian Circassians. And so the Israeli army recognized them and allowed them to continue serving as professional soldiers in the IDF. Uh, but here's a story. I mean, uh, you know, it's horrible uh, that uh, uh, one and a half million uh, Armenians died in World War I. I think that, and I'm not justifying it, but wars are horrible. And there are, there's a lot of accounts to be settled. And so I think that in a way, maybe perhaps the Turks took it down on the Armenians for what the Russians did in 1854 in Sochi. Uh, so there's a long history. Um, I'm not going to defend the, the Islamic cause or the Palestinians, but when people look at what's going on and they attack Israel all the time, uh, you know, the, the Muslims have been attacking Israel and the Jews for, for over 100, 150 years. Uh, Jews are always a very suppressed minority in Islamic countries. Uh, so there's a lot of accounts. You know, the, the Muslims attack Israel, Israel counterattacks. So the whole world picks on Israel. Nobody looks at why Islam is attacking Israel for the same reason that Islam is, is a civilizational war against the Christians. That's exactly right. And, you know, when I think about this, and I know that... Uh, especially among Christian people, when they look at Psalm 83, they always call this the Psalm 83 war. And one of the things that I've looked at on that is it's more of a confederacy. It's not so much just a war, but it's a confederacy. And we do see uh, Esau, the tabernacles of Esau, and then it begins to name all the most, uh, Muslim countries, Islamic countries around that join in with them. And you mentioned how the Catholic Church is, is, you know, backs a lot of these countries like Turkey because any of the Sunnis, and most all Sunnis are loyal to, the, to Rome. And the Shiites, like you said, they're, they totally disagree with one another and fight and kill each other. Um, so I see a confederacy there coming together and, and, and not only just a confederacy there, but obviously the entire world. Uh, the only reason we see the United States against Israel is because of the administration that we have right now. And the question is, are they going, I mean, his term is up, so to speak, they're having new elections, but what's going to happen uh, before the elections there, uh, before things change hands? Are we going to end up possibly in a war? Because like you said, war is good for business in their mind. Uh, I know that the generals, uh, the U.S. generals that are over NATO in Europe, uh, that they're pushing for this war. Uh, I actually got to hear some of the, you know, because it was made public, some of the, uh, the interceptions that the Russians did uh, with the U.S. Embassy in uh, Ukraine uh, and, and another party calling for the total annihilation for all the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in eastern, in eastern Ukraine. So there is, it's almost like a genocide that's been going on in this country. And if Russia doesn't step in, you know, these people are going to be genocide if he doesn't do something soon. And it's only by the grace of God that Crimea was taken back. And not to mention, what about the Jewish people in Ukraine? Like you, Avi, my family comes from the same countries. Mine are, my forefathers are all either Slovakians, Ukrainians, or Russians. Uh, I have the same type of background. And I didn't even know that uh, in the beginning, but 
I clearly have to stand with what's right and to just to genocide people for no reason. You know, as a Jewish people, my mother's side, thousands were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, now that I know my father's side, thousands and thousands were killed in his family as well. And, you know, so we take a personal issue with, 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 with genocide. And you even brought up in the, uh, the conference here that there were 7,000 or no, 7 million Christians that were killed in the Holocaust as well. Right. And not many people bring this issue up, but but clearly, the, you know, if, if the Pope of Rome wants a depopulation agenda, I'm concerned that there that there's forces behind the scenes that will create a war uh, to do exactly that. And the Confederacy that we see in Psalm 83 is that the name of Israel is no more brought brought into memory. And this is what obviously the World Council of Churches is doing in Israel this week. Uh, it ends on the 26th. But they're doing a protest. They're in, they've been in Bethlehem protesting uh, the Jewish people's right to this land. And, and, you know, we need true Christians to stand up for Israel and to be, you know, activists to stand up for the Jewish people. Your thoughts? Yes. Well, I, there are two things I want to say. Firstly, that, um, you know, that it's true. One and a half million Christians died, Armenians in World War I, six million Jews in World War II. Uh, after that, we know that, I don't know how many millions, but many millions of black people were slaughtered in Africa, um, slaughtered, enslaved, raped, uh, uh, horrible things, tortured. Nobody cares, because if the Muslims are doing the killing, it's okay. Uh, in, in the early 1990s, there was a civil war in Yugoslavia and NATO actually backed the Muslims and attacked the Serbian Christians, who were the good guys. I mean, there's no good guy in a war, but, but, the, but the Christians were sacrificed for the Islamic petrodollars. Uh, president Bill Clinton, former President Bill Clinton, is guilty of helping to form an Islamic Republic in Bosnia, an Islamic Republic in Kosovo, in addition to Albania, uh, which already existed. And now there is a 40% Albanian minority in a country called Macedonia. And Macedonia now, very soon, will be taken over by the Muslims because the world backs the Muslims. So now you will have four Islamic republics in southeastern uh, Europe. There will be a land bridge all the way to Turkey. Because don't forget, in the north of uh, Greece, uh, you have a, an area called Thrace. And there you have 100,000 uh, Thracian uh, Muslims in, in, in northeastern Greece. Uh, many of the refugees from Syria and all these people, the boat people, many of them are just going across the land border from Turkey into Greece. Right, right. So, so you're, you, what you have basically is a, a, a non-violent military invasion of so-called refugees into Europe from Turkey. Um, and I think this is all by plan. Um, so we see blacks being killed, we see Jews being killed, Armenians being killed, Yugoslavs being killed. Uh, now we see a new Holocaust here in the Middle East. And I wanted to share something. Uh, I'm forming a Judeo-Christian uh, political party to run for the Knesset. Uh, as part of my efforts, uh, I, I am in touch, or I was in touch with someone uh, in the Vatican, senior person, I don't want to mention his name, uh, then I had a, a heart operation, and so my son, Aaron, who's CEO of Lipkin Tours, uh, went in my place to the Vatican to meet with him. I mean, the, Vat the Catholic Church has to know uh, what I'm doing because half the, the people in Israel who are called Christians are Catholics. Half are Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. We just don't got no Protestants in Israel yet. Uh, but the, the point is, my idea as a grand wall-to-wall -wall coalition of all Jews and Christians. So, you, you know, you can't ignore the Catholics. I know many people watching uh, your program don't maybe... They actually, they, they will stand for Catholic people. Yeah. It's just they realize, because one thing that we try to show is that it's, it's the leadership right. is where the problem is. It's not the Catholic people. Yeah. Many of the Catholic people are very good people, very got great hearts, wonderful people, but it's the, it's the leadership. This is exactly where I'm going. So... Uh, my son came back from the Vatican. He was there for half an hour. Very, you know, correct, uh, polite meeting. And nothing really uh, talked about in, in depth. 
And he came back and he said, again, I don't want to mention the name, but uh, that we were supposed to meet with a very senior Catholic official here in Jerusalem. And uh, I heard that he was speaking at a public event, so I went. And then at the end, questions and answers, you know, I said, I'm forming a Judeo-Christian party. What does the Vatican have to say about that? And he said, uh, if your party's uh, uh, objective is to unite Jews and Christians to gang up on the Muslims, the Vatican opposes it. Now, my son Aaron said to me, you know, Daddy, I got to tell you, my son told me a story. I, I thought I knew all the stories that uh, the, the former mayor of Bethlehem 30 years ago went to Yitzhak Rabin. Not 30 years ago, it was 1992, during the Oslo peace process, so-called peace process, and said to Rabin, listen, if you're going to give Palestinians their own land, then Bethlehem must be with Israel. Bethlehem has to be annexed to Jerusalem, otherwise there will be ethnic cleansing. So Yitzhak Rabin, to his credit, and may, may his memory be blessed, Yitzhak Rabin said, okay, we can annex Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Don't forget, Bethlehem is only 15, 20 minute drive from Jerusalem. Uh, he said, just, Rabin said to Elias Frage, the mayor, just get me a letter from the Catholic Church and a letter from the Greek Church, we'll annex it. The answer came back, no. The Catholic Church and the Greek Church uh, are in solidarity with the Palestinian liberation cause. So, so the Catholic Church and the Greek Church worked to the detriment of their own believers. And today Bethlehem, after 2,000 years, is 90% Muslim. Uh, so the, the Catholic Church really is doing a disservice to its own believers, and that breaks my heart. Yes, if I remember right, too, Avi, it wasn't it, was it was it either eighty percent Christian originally in Bethlehem? Right, eighty ninety percent. Right, and then this happened, and, and see, this is our issue because one of the things that I've even brought out in some of the broadcasts that we have done is looking at Daniel chapter eleven. If in fact, and this is this is only a conjecture here. I like what Chuck always says. He throws these conjectures in, Chuck Missler. Uh, but if the prince that shall come is of the people uh, uh, that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which we know Titus was the, the leader of this, him being a Roman, and let's say that the Vatican does play, the Vatican leadership plays that role out in, in the days that we're living in now. When you jump over to chapter 11, I forget which verse that's in there, but we find out that that same prince comes up strong with a small people. And I believe that the, even though I, I, I do not support the, the Muslim belief whatsoever, but I do believe that, it's, that that very well could be the Palestinian people that Rome is using for their own political gain. And that's why I think that they're willing to sacrifice the Christian people on the altar, uh, uh, on the Muslim altar, in order to attain their ultimate goal, and that's to take uh, take Jerusalem. And and that, and really, if you look, if you go back to Joel Bainerman, uh, you know, God bless his heart, you know, because uh, he exposed uh, the 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 truth behind the Oslo Accords in 1990, especially 1993, when uh, Shimon Peres was uh, working with a deal with the Vatican the entire time was what was really going on, and and supposedly in the articles that Joel wrote that Shimon Perez stated to the Vatican that they would internationalize Jerusalem, give, give the, uh, the one part of Jerusalem to the Palestinians for a capital, and, uh, and they would put NATO forces in here. Okay, now here comes, remember I said, I said, wanted to say two things. I said the first thing, no, no, this is perfect, perfect. Now I come with the second part. Uh, you know that today, Homeland Security uh, Manual in the United States says, if you're a Christian, you're a terrorist. Yes. And if you believe in the Bible, Jew or Christian, you're mentally unstable. And I, you know, every church I go to, I have to do this. And I say, you know, I have to quote from Isaiah 19, 1 and 2, because in Isaiah 19, 1 and 2, uh, there's something which, if I had quoted it before February 11th, 2011, the beginning of the Arab Spring, people would have thought I was crazy. Now, you have to remember, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton was attacking Israel. She was Secretary of State in 2009 until 2013. Attacking Israel, attacking Israel. If the weather was bad, it was Israel's fault. No matter what happened, if people were killing each other, it was Israel's fault. You know, not Jews. Uh, it was Israel's fault. And one day a Tunisian fruit vendor is arrested for not paying a bribe to a policeman. They confiscate his cart, they confiscate his produce, his scales. 
Uh, and then uh, after uh, they take away his stuff, a, a Muslim policewoman slaps him in the face, the ultimate affront to a Muslim man, self-respecting Muslim man. And at some stage they have to release him, so they release him. And uh, he goes to the nearest gasoline station, buys a quart, uh, a liter of uh, gasoline, pours it all over himself, and he self-immolates. And all the people in this little town had cell phones, and they're all taking pictures of him with their cell phones as he was burning to a crisp. And within minutes, all of Tunisia was up in flames. This was the beginning of the Arab Spring. Yeah. The next day, Libya was up in flames. The next day, Egypt was up in flames. The next day, Yemen and Syria were up in flames. And the whole Middle East imploded. I call it God reshuffling the deck. Now, what does it say in Isaiah 19, 1 and 2? And this applies not only to Egypt, it applies to the whole Middle East. It says, Egyptian will fight Egyptian, brother will fight brother, neighbor will fight neighbor, and city will fight city. This is a perfect description of exactly what's happening today in all these countries that I just mentioned. So there's a saying, man plans and God laughs. So Hillary Clinton and the Obama administration, and forgive me for saying it, but even the Republican administrations before, remember George W. Bush and Condi Rice, they were saying, Palestinian state in 2008. What Palestinian state? Uh, and as an Israeli army officer, I was trained that uh, the Syrian army was a formidable enemy. Well, you tell me, where's Syria today? Look at how magnificent God is. Yes. Syria has been neutralized as an enemy of Israel. Uh, Iraq has been neutralized as an enemy of Israel. On the contrary, we now have a group in the north called the Kurds in the north of uh, Iraq. And I think the day is going to come that ISIS will be defeated, the Kurds will work their way south to the Euphrates, and we Israelis will work our way north to the Euphrates. Our neighbors to the northeast are going to be the Kurds. Uh, uh, I think Lebanon is going to be attacked by ISIS and by uh, fanatic Al-Qaeda and Nusra, uh, people trained by the United States. And as soon as they get guns and they are sent to the area, they join Al-Qaeda and Nusra. Can't understand how stupid you know, the American policy is. But uh, Republican and Democrat administrations are all guilty of the same, the same fallacies. And I wrote this in my book, Islamic Rivalry. You know, let me tell you something, guys. You've got, you've got to look at Avi's books. Uh, incredible, incredible information in there. Uh, I want to, I got a comment to make on this about the guy burning himself, and, and thanks to Hillary Clinton and what they started there. I can't speak who, but there is, uh, I sat down one night, uh, I was in D.C. with one of uh, Obama's, uh, one of, part of his administration. Uh, they'd been in both sides of the administration, both the Republican and Democratic, but this time they were in, in with the, the uh, Democratic under the Obama administration. And this gentleman here shared with me what happened in Benghazi, the, the, or the, the Arab Spring, where this got started. And, he, and the, he was talking to me about the man that burned himself alive. And he made a very strange comment because at this time, it was not long before that, that in America, in D.C., there was a black man that, that torched himself as well. And he said to me, it worked, it worked in, in Egypt, but we couldn't get it to work in America. And that just spoke volumes to me right there. And I know that the United States has different types of warfare that is mind warfare that they're doing. And, uh, and, and, and he elaborated on a little bit about that. So I'm wondering really what did happen in Egypt? Was this something that they perpetrated themselves to cause this man to do it? Now we know, like you said, the ultimate insult for this man to do that, but was there something even behind that that caused this? Because he implied that that's what it was, that they had intentionally caused the Arab Spring, the US did, as well as they were trying, because what he was saying to me there was that, there, that the Obama administration was trying to get the United States and the United States to try to get the black people to rise up and riot in the country for, for whatever reason, uh, who knows at the time, we didn't elaborate on that, but they were trying to get the same thing to happen there. Yes, well, I, you see, I see President Obama as a, a, a mixture of communist and Islamic. Uh, now, theoretically, communist and Islamic are uh, irreconcilable, except for one thing, they both hate Christians, and they right. hate Christian America. And the problem here is a civilizational problem in the US. Will America 
uh, continue to be Christian, or shall I say, will America return to being Christian? And I'm one of those Jews. I'm not a Christian, but I'm one of those Jews who calls for a Christian revival. Israel needs yes. that America be Christian. And so I'm ready to help any Christian or organization that will re restore America to its Christian roots. I'm also forming a, a political party in Israel that will base, be based on an ideology similar to that of the founding fathers of the United States of America. Right. That's a very good point. Now, speaking of that, and, and there's two things I want to still go to if we have a little bit of time to do it. Um, that's going to be the economics of the United States, because I know that, that you believe that there's not going to be an economic collapse. Correct. And, uh, and I'll share a quick thought that I have on that as well, because I have a similar view myself. Um, maybe that will even tie in with the New World Order. And then I want to talk to you as well about uh, the internationalizing of Jerusalem, what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I've actually photographed where they have the tunnel down here on Highway 1 coming up from Tel Aviv when they were under construction of that, and I have actually wondered if that's not possibly going to be a checkpoint for Jerusalem. Some people say it's part of the uh, rail system they're building. It just doesn't seem to fit, because if I'm not mistaken, I'll be now cars are driving underneath it. Another thought altogether. But let's go to the economic part about the U.S. I know that uh, I know Jonathan Kahn had, uh, predicted that because of the Shemitah year and everything that the, the economy would collapse. I've always believed that if the economy goes down, it would not be just the U.S., it would be a worldwide thing, but it would be a temporary thing only to bring about a new world order with a new standard of currency to begin with. So to me, it is, even if, it, if this is the way it goes, I believe it's only a temporary issue because they want to bring in a one world government, they want to have a one world leader and, and figurehead and, and one world religion, as we see that Pope Francis is clearly trying to do that, and he's in the United States right now, speaking to Congress, speaking to the United Nations, all of these things concern me because to me, he's trying to get that, I, I think he's actually politically pushing for the position of the one world leader. I know that Pope Benedict called for the Vatican to be over the world economic system, that it should be uh, redone, and of course he's calling for a redistribution of wealth, which to me, Avi, the only way that they could redistribute the wealth is if they collapse the economy and then they give the people only so much of a percentage on their dollar, but then they've automatically got that redistribution in a roundabout way. Okay, well firstly, as you know, my wife Rachel, who is now actually retiring this uh, month, uh, from her 30 years of work at the Israeli radio services monitoring the broadcasts of our Arabic-speaking uh, neighbors. And ISIS, uh, they're funny, you know, because they, they talk and they laugh uh, while they're talking. And say, so, you know, he said, you know those boats from Libya carrying refugees to Italy, so-called refugees? First thing they said, 4,000 of them are ISIS vanguard troops. Secondly, you know those guys with the funny uniforms in the Vatican? They're guarding the Vatican in the Swiss, Swiss guards. Swiss, Swiss guard, yes. Yeah, they're going to be. They are going to be breakfast for the ISIS. And ISIS said, you know, that they're going to blow up the Vatican. They're going to get the Pope. They're going to kill him. They're going to blow up the Vatican, and then they're going to turn into a mosque. So you know, everybody has this arrogance uh, about the Vatican taking over and one world religion. No, I, I, Islam has its own plans. I mean, unless unless Islam gets banned. And I believe Islam will be banned by the one world government, by, by the Catholic, uh, American, and uh, European uh, alliance. But regarding the US economy, uh, the greatest motor of economic growth in any economy in the world is housing. Now, what does America need for its economy to take off? It needs a housing, not a bubble, but a the need for housing the immigrants coming from the Islamic countries. Saudi Arabia will pay for the housing. So American dollar will be stronger, the American economy will be stronger than ever. My wife picked up a broadcast 30 years ago where the Saudis were saying, even if it takes us 150 years, we're gonna make America a Muslim country. Wow. Now, after 30 years, she hears them, same people, we were wrong. We thought it was going to take 150 years. We were wrong. It's only going to take us 30 years to make America a Muslim country. How do you make America a Muslim country? You bring in 30, 50, 100 million Muslims. You suppress Christianity and Judaism. And what's going to happen is these tens of millions of Muslims are going to come into Canada, US, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, European countries, and they're going to kill the Jews. 
there's going to be a tsunami of Jewish immigration from the West. The American economy will be doing well, at least until God decides, decides enough is enough. Um, and I believe if you have 7 million Jews outside of Israel, those who are not killed by ISIS, and ISIS is cataloging every Jew in the West. It's not such a big deal to catalog 7 million Jews. And if the Jews are married, let's say, to 80% uh, to Christians, you're going to have 3, 4 million Christians married to Jews. And they have to be killed, too. So you're going to have a, a homecoming to Israel of, of 10, 15 million Jews and Christians. And then there are those crazy Christians who just want to go to Israel anyway. And uh, I believe that the Middle East is being uh, depopulated by God to make way for the expansion of Israel's borders. Israel is not going to shrink. Israel is going to expand. And it's going to expand at the request, at the demand of the Druze, the Christians, uh, Shiites, uh, Kurds, uh, Azidis. They're all going to demand that Israel come in and defend them because nobody else is defending them except Putin. Putin is defending them. So I see some interesting things happening, about to happen. I think Lebanon will be the next to fall. Uh, the Christians of Lebanon, who are 28%, uh, the Sunnis, even the Shiites, uh, even the Druze are going to demand that Israel come in and, and defend them from ISIS. Um, you have 700,000 Druze on Mount of Druze in South Syria. They're going to be annihilated by the Sunnis unless Israel protects them or Russia protects them. So um, actually, I see a, a, a close coordinating uh, role between uh, Russia and uh, Israel and Syria? I think it is so, because like I said, I've gotten the one letter uh, from, a, from a gentleman that's very close to Netanyahu that said that, and that was a year ago. He yeah. was already telling me that they would come in, they had made an agreement, they were going to ally together. And, um, you know, I know that Netanyahu just flew over there, but, you know, to, to, as they were saying, to make sure that everything was okay with what uh, Putin was doing, that could have just been more to say to make it look good uh, so that as far as politically it looks correct but uh, but it seems very clear that that Russia and Israel has been working very close together for quite some time now um, one other one thing I'd like to ask you about though Avi and just in, we can kind of wrap it up here is as I mentioned a little bit earlier here on the broadcast in 93 94 we saw that the Vatican and Shimon Perez had made the alliance they were working to bring about a at least the, the, the idea was to internationalize Jerusalem. I've actually did a video one time on YouTube and I called it uh, faking a millennial reign is what I did as far as what the Vatican looks like they're trying to do. They're trying to get control of, the, of Israel, take it away from the Jewish people. And that's a major concern for myself. And then as I, I'm in Israel constantly, I mean, I'm here every other month practically and I'm always here sometimes a month, two months, sometimes just a week, whatever the case may be. And I've been watching all the changes. Now, I know we've been building the rail system for a number of years now to, to bring in uh, better transportation, but I also see from the north and the south of Jerusalem, uh, the, from the West Bank, they built major highways into Jerusalem. Uh, and then I saw the arches going up on Highway 1. And, you know, there was my own, my own thinking, but I'm thinking, are they actually building a checkpoint for us to have to go through eventually as far as, not so much us, but as far as Israelis? I don't think so. Okay. So that was, a, that was a concern of mine as well. But like I said, a lot of people are saying that this is actually uh, just part of the rail system that's going up there. Um, but it is clear, in, at least from what I can see, that Rome would like to get control of, of, of Jerusalem. Uh, they threw the Jews out of, the, out of King David's tomb uh, in order to do their mass there. They, they took and, uh, you know, I didn't have a problem with them doing the mass that they did in the upper room because it is a Christian site. If they wanted to do that, that was fine. But when they actually took and throw the Jews out of King David's tomb in order for the, the, the Catholic Church to do a mass there, that's where it bothered me tremendously. Uh, but that's, that's a temporary thing. Yes, that is temporary. But... We need the Christian people to stand with the Jewish people in order to maintain that Israel is a Jewish country. It's not a state. It's a nation, not, not just a state. Uh, it did concern me that the Vatican declared a Palestinian state. Uh, and who knows what the United Nations is about to do. 
And the other thing that concerns me too is that uh, that they're backing, and this is not just the Vatican by themselves, but look at all the nations that are that are standing there with Iran uh, to continue this nuclear program. And um, eventually, to me, Israel will end up having to take out the, the issue in Iran in order to, to keep that from progressing. But what are your things, thoughts on some of these issues? Well, firstly, I, I want to drop a bombshell here. Uh, Article 74 and 75 of the agreement with Iran uh, say that Iran will be uh, given uh, by the United States and Russia uh, uh, fusion uh, energy, meaning the hydrogen bomb. Okay, now you know you have fission and you have fusion. Fission can be used for peaceful purposes. Fusion cannot. In other words, uranium-235, all the discussions were about uranium-235 and fission. The hydrogen bomb, there is no developed uh, uh, peaceful use for it. But Iran has demanded, and Iran is going to receive something that only the Americans and the Russians have, and that's hydrogen bomb technology. There's only one purpose, it's for a bomb. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we say hamevin uh, yavin, we say in Hebrew, hamevin yavin. He who is capable of understanding will understand where it's all going. So we'll, uh, we'll see where it goes. Mm. Avi, it's great to have you with us. And let me just remind you guys once again here, um, two things I'd like to bring up. And uh, one is the Avi, like, you know, he's starting the, the Christian Judeo party. Uh, here in Israel definitely needs help with that and we'll put that here on the screen for you at the end as well It's at P.O. Box 18209 Jerusalem, Israel 91181 is a zip code there and you can make the check payable to uh, What was that again? Uh, they can make a check out to me, but I'll just have to pay 50% taxes on it Okay, it, advocate uh, is a lawyer ADV period ADV is advocate Caleb Myers for the foundation of the Gush Tanahi party. And we'll actually put that on the screen for you yeah. so you have time to be able to see right. that. Uh, as well, you can go to Avi's website. It's www.vicmord.com. That's V-I-C-M-O-R-D.com where you can uh, see, see the books and, and the different uh, things that Avi has to offer there. And one thing that I thought was interesting is that Avi, Avi's uh, son is the CEO of a travel agency here in Israel, that they do tours. He also, if I'm not mistaken, uh, your son as well takes and uh, Aaron does the tour does tour guiding as well. Is that right? Yes, correct. Lipkin tours. Uh, I don't think Islam is the great enemy. Islam will be defeated. It'll be defeated by the one world government. It has nothing to do with Jews or Christians. The one world government will defeat it because of the oil. Um, I think the great threat to Jews and Christians and uh, to God but of course God's gonna win, uh, is atheism. The lack of faith, and that includes people who are nominally Jewish or Christian or whatever, uh, but Lipkin Tours takes groups to places that until recently did not exist. They're in the Bible. And so a lot of people say, oh, the Bible's just fairy tales. No, the Bible is true. And we prove the veracity of the Bible in our tours. So I suggest if people wanna come, they should bring a Bible in their hands. Every place we go, open your Bible. This is where you're standing. Uh, Shiloh really does exist. Uh, we even found a mosaic. You know, people say Shiloh never existed. And that, if just Shiloh didn't exist, then Samuel the prophet didn't exist, and King David didn't exist, and King Saul, Saul didn't exist. Um, there was a, a mosaic found at the entrance of a, a destroyed church. It was an earthquake. This church was destroyed. And they, found, they dug down you know, two yards and they found the mosaic. May Jesus, the Lord Jesus, uh, have mercy on the people of Shiloh. So that's how we knew that Shiloh was there. So if Shiloh was there, then the prophet Samuel was there. The, the Ark of the Covenant was there, 369 years. Um, so uh, what we do is uh, uh, interdisciplinary. We show what, how the Muslims preserve all the biblical names. Archaeology proves that they're really these places. Uh, so, so you go through the Bible, and each step of the Bible, you see it's true. So it's not fairy tales. Right. So in the end, every knee will bend, and every tongue will swear loyalty. Amen, amen. Thank you, Avi, for being with us today. My pleasure. God bless you for watching. I'm Stephen Benun with Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening.